Your Excellency, former Prime Minister of Bhutan, Dasho Tsering Dobge, um, Excellencies, Dashos, ladies and gentlemen, friends all, we are very, very grateful to all of you for joining us for this afternoon of distinguished lectures on Bhutan in this auditorium. Uh, I would like to explain simply how the afternoon will run. We will have the first lecture by uh, Dasho Tsering Dobge, uh, followed by a time of interchange and questions and answers. For those of you who are remaining for the second lecture, there is an interlude. Um, there will be bottles of water on the desks, and there will be a little bit of perhaps music and perhaps movement. It's not unheard of for people to join the dances of Bhutan and master them in five minutes. So you are welcome to take that opportunity. <clears throat> I am very honored to recognize Dr. Ralph Walker, who has been the chairman of the General Board of Oxford University, has been head of the Division of Humanities, and is fellow emeritus of Magdalen College, and he will chair this lecture. Dr. Walker. Well, thank you very much. I find it a bit strange, really, to be introducing someone, the Honorable Dasha Tsering Dobge, whom many of you will know more of than I do, and have known, almost all of you will have known for longer than I have. Uh, but I feel very honored to be asked to do it. Uh, Dasha Tsering Dobge, uh, I met only yesterday, uh, but already I feel as though he's an old friend. He's got a remarkable capacity to reach out to everyone. A very welcome capacity it is. In this country, I fear it's a bit rare to meet people of very great distinction who make you feel immediately at ease. Immediately that you can talk with them completely freely, quite straightforwardly. But maybe that's just commoner in Bhutan. I don't know. At any rate, it's my pleasure to welcome him uh, as everyone on behalf of the University of Oxford. And uh, I'm very glad to welcome the members of the Bhutan Society of the United Kingdom and those attending the inaugural conference of the International Society of Bhutan Studies, especially. Um, and there's a delegation of 25 of these who've joined from Bhutan to join us. We're very, very honored about that. And there are Bhutanese people studying and working in the UK and Euro in Europe, uh, and many from this university and city whose curiosity has been piqued about Bhutan. So I hope that during uh, this uh, three days, and particularly, specifically this afternoon, uh, piqued curiosity will be appropriately stimulated. As I said, uh, Dasha Tsering Tobge needs no real introduction, but I would just remind you of the energetic, articulate, hardworking and impressive leadership qualities uh, that he has, and uh, he is a very impressive man. A Bhutanese politician, environmentalist, cultural advocate, prime minister for five years until last August, uh, a very considerable figure. He's at home in, intell in, in intellectual activity in educational institutions like this one. He started his career in 1991 with the technical and vocational education section of the educational division in Bhutan and subsequently created and led the National Technical Training Authority from 1999 to 2003. As I've said, he's somebody who resonates with people well. Uh, and it's therefore suitable that he directed the Human Resources Department in the Ministry of Labour for a while before entering politics, establishing the first registered political party and eventually leading the country during a precipitous era. During his tenure, poverty in all its dimensions halved. I don't know where that record could be equaled. Economic growth for a time was the fastest in the world. Many crises were weathered, and he has done extremely well. So we're very lucky that he has come to see us. 
He has an impressive online profile with many highly viewed speeches. TED Talks, including others including speeches at the UN General Assembly as part of the Multidimensional Poverty Peer Network, also launched here in Oxford. He may be so popular partly because he's able to articulate his profound but often not completely clear thoughts and feelings <laughs> to, to, to articulate the, the unclear thoughts and feelings of others, rather, uh, about a range of issues with fresh intensity that clarifies it. So we're indeed fortunate to have Tsering Togge here with us today. So I now invite you, Dasho, uh, to speak on your theme, Does Bhutan Matter? Stories from a Young Democracy. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. I have the honor of conveying to you the greetings and warm wishes of His Majesty the King of Bhutan. Thank you. Dr. Ralph Walker for this undeserved introduction that you have provided me. I would recommend an introduction from Dr. Ralph Walker for any politician that has lost an election. <laughs> it makes one feel very deserved. Thank you so much, sir. In the last five years as Prime Minister, I have been invited to speak about Bhutan on several occasions. It's always an honor to talk about my country. But this time, I feel triply honored. The first honor is that I speak as a private citizen, so I do not carry the heavy burden of accountability of what I say. The second is that I'm speaking as part of the inaugural conference of the International Society for Bhutan Studies. This means that I'm addressing a friendly audience, one that is interested in the affairs of my country. And the third honor is that I'm speaking at the renowned Sheldonian Theater, an iconic and historic landmark of Oxford. I feel deeply humbled knowing that this venerable theater has hosted many significant lectures by scholars, experts, and leaders from around the world. I thank the organizers for inviting me to deliver a lecture on Bhutan. But honestly, I'm not qualified to lecture, even on Bhutan, a subject that is extremely close to my heart. So Dr. Walker, I'm not at home in, uh, in intellectual centers. So I'll leave the lectures to the experts here, many of who are leading in-depth discussions on the exciting features of various dimensions of Bhutan, including our history and politics, our culture and religion, and our environment and governance. On my part, I will attempt to provide a broad overview of Bhutan, a simple introduction of sorts. After all, many of you must be hearing about Bhutan for the first time, so an introduction is in order. But my introduction will focus on what I consider to be extraordinary about my country. In particular, I will talk about our leadership that has made Bhutan what it is today. Special, different, unique, extraordinary. Before I proceed further, I must apologize to those of you who have been to Bhutan, and I see many in the audience who have been to Bhutan, or those who have made the time to read about Bhutan. I risk boring you with details that you already know. I also apologize if I appear foolish, boasting about my country, blowing our own trumpet, 
If I sing our own praises, I am also acutely aware of our many problems and challenges. So in the interest of establishing that Bhutan matters, please indulge me if I glorify my tiny country and forgive me if I make it sound unrealistically like Shangri-La. I am humbled that Dr. Ralph Walker, a distinguished and highly accomplished scholar, is chairing this session. Thank you, Professor. Your mere presence here adds tremendous value to my simple presentation. Dr. Walker, if you visit Bhutan, sorry, when you visit, when you visit us, you will probably visit the Taksang Monastery. Taksang, which is precariously perched on a steep cliff face at an altitude of 3,100 meters, is one of the most photographed structures in Bhutan. The monastery was originally built in 1692 to mark the spot where, nine centuries earlier, Guru Rinpoche, Guru Padmasambhava, first landed in Bhutan on the back of a flying tigress. Taksang, which literally means tiger's nest, is revered as the exact spot from where Buddhism took root in Bhutan. So to us, Bhutanese, the tiger's nest, Taksang, is sacred indeed. Obviously, there are other things that we also revere, that we were never colonized, for example, and that our culture is thriving, that our country is a biodiversity hotspot, and that we are the only carbon neutral country in the world, that we are a functioning welfare state, and that we are one of the youngest democracies in the world. But what we revere the most, what we hold to be the most sacred above all else is our leadership, specifically the leadership of our kings. Bhutan is unique and successful in its own way because of one and only one factor, the extraordinary leadership of our kings who have led by example and who continue to do so. That's why our monarchy is the most important institution in Bhutan. It is a symbol of our unity, the protector of our people, and the fountainhead of our future. Bhutan's monarchy was established in 1907, so it is about 111 years old. The reigning king, His Majesty Jigmi Kesar Namgye Wongchuk, is our fifth hereditary monarch. Incidentally, His Majesty attended college in Oxford. He was in Magdalen College about a decade or so ago. Bhutan has been blessed with enlightened monarchs who have dedicated their lives to improving the well-being of their people. All of us in Bhutan love our kings. We revere them and we look up to them as Plato's ideal of the philosopher king. In this day and age, that in itself is extraordinary. But there are other aspects of our monarchy that are also quite extraordinary. For example, our first king was elected as the hereditary monarch. Gonsa Uge Wongchuk did not conquer the country to establish monarchy. Instead, in 1907, after centuries of civil strife, leaders from various parts of Bhutan got together and elected him as their first hereditary king. But what's extraordinary is that exactly 100 years later, in 2007, our king returned that power to the people by imposing democracy in the country. What's even more extraordinary is that we, the people, can remove a king through a vote of no confidence. That was first introduced by the third king in 1959. 
And after several unsuccessful attempts by the people to discard the practice, it is now enshrined in the constitution at the insistence of the king. Furthermore, and again at the insistence of the king, a unique provision in the constitution requires our kings to step down upon reaching the age of 65 in favor of the next in line to the throne. In fact, the fourth king, His Majesty Jigmi Singhi Wongchuk, did not wait till he turned 65. He stepped down voluntarily at, and he abdicated in 2006. He was just 51 years old then and was at the peak of his popularity. So we actually have a king enjoying retirement. What this means is that we are blessed to have three kings, one in retirement, one reigning, and one future king, an adorable crown prince who turns three next month. We in Bhutan consider the situation extremely auspicious. Here's another fact. Our king has no personal wealth. Today, when some of the richest people in the world continue to be monarchs, our king does not own any personal property. All citizens have access to the king. We celebrate the fact that the poor, the landless, and the destitute can approach the king for intervention and help. And to create easier access for the people, His Majesty travels throughout the country. He has personally visited almost every village and every nook and cranny of the country, making him the most widely traveled person in Bhutan. Finally, and most importantly for us, our kings have single-handedly secured Bhutan's sovereignty. You see, Bhutan is a small country. It is the size of Switzerland, but with just 730,000 odd people. And it is sandwiched between the world's two most populous countries, India to the south and China to the north. Furthermore, it is surrounded by other densely populated areas of Bangladesh and Nepal. So it is quite unlikely. It's really unlikely that Bhutan has remained a sovereign country. What's more, we have never been colonized. It looks like Bhutan is just one of three countries in Asia which can claim to have never been colonized. It's not that foreign powers did not try to colonize Bhutan. The Tibetans invaded us no less than 17 times. And after working out lasting peace with our Tibetan neighbors, we had to fight the British. First, in 1772, with British East India Company, and then twice again, twice more in 1865, with the British Empire. Added to that, Bhutan had to deal with threats from missionaries and immigrants and political interference. But we succeeded in persevering as an independent country. Well, our geography helped. The high, treacherous mountains in the north and the dense, malaria-infested jungles in the south did insulate us like a natural forest. But what really protected us from the rest of the world was a policy of self-imposed isolation. When this policy was threatened, our kings resorted to diplomacy. And if that failed, they did not hesitate to personally lead their troops to battle in order to protect our country. That war of 1865 with the British I alluded to. Then, for example, Deb Jimin Namgyal, the father of our first king, personally fought the invading British army. But more recently, in 2003, this is barely 15 years ago, His Majesty the Fourth King led his small army from the front, literally from the front, to dislodge Indian militants from our southern jungles. 
The militants had quietly entered the country and effectively entrenched themselves in 30-odd camps. His Majesty's decision to forcefully expel them came after more than 10 years of negotiation and determined persuasion had failed to convince them to leave peacefully. Had it not been for the great force, today Bhutan would be probably be a hotbed of terrorism and militancy. A far cry from the peaceful, happy Shangri-La that many see us as today. So the single reason that Bhutan is a sovereign country is the extraordinary leadership exercised by our kings. But what's the point of a sovereign nation if the people are not happy? That's why our kings have given us, and through us the world, cross-national happiness, a pioneering vision that aims to improve the well-being and happiness of our people. In 1972, His Majesty Jigmi Singhi Wongchuk became the fourth king of Bhutan. He was barely 16 years old and was the world's youngest reigning monarch at that time. This was in 1972. A few years into his reign, an Indian journalist asked, Your Majesty, how big is your country's GDP? His Majesty immediately replied, For Bhutan, gross national happiness is more important than gross national product. Put simply, gross national happiness, or GNH, is an idea that steers the government away from chasing unrestrained material growth towards sustainable economic development that is balanced with social progress, cultural preservation, environmental protection, and good governance. It is essentially a program of social and economic change, putting into effect the notion that the ultimate purpose of governments must be to promote the collective happiness of society. So it represents a holistic set of values and priorities that are intended to guide public policy as well as institutions and agents across society. His Majesty the King has paraphrased GNH as simply development with values and commanded that GNH must be a national conscience guiding us towards making wise decisions for a better future. All development in Bhutan is driven by gross national happiness. In fact, our constitution requires that the state to promote those conditions that will enable the pursuit of gross national happiness. But what are those conditions that enable the pursuit of GNH? The Center for Bhutan Studies, who are the main authority on GNH, have identified nine domains as the conditions that influence the happiness and well-being of people. The first three domains are straightforward, living standard, health, and education. The importance of these have been widely accepted by all governments for quite some time now. The next two domains have also been started, the next two domains have also started gaining currency among governments. They are environment and governance. The final four domains, however, are still at the cutting edge of government development policy. They, these are psychological well-being, time use, cultural resilience, and community vitality. The Center for Bhutan Studies and GNH Research conducts extensive GNH surveys periodically to establish where we stand as a nation in GNH terms. The results of these surveys are used by the government, they're supposed to be used by the government, when formulating national policies and plans. I certainly hope that some of you here would be interested in discussing GNH and its links to public policy. If so, Tasho Karma Ura, who is the president of CBS, has a lecture immediately following my talk. And I invite you to seek him out and his colleagues who are also here in attendance here to talk about GNH. 
Last year, GNH went a step further. Instead of limiting GNH to the public sector, the Center for Bhutan Studies developed a program to measure the GNH of business organizations. This innovative program allows businesses to measure their happiness levels and are certified as GNH compliant upon achieving a certain minimum threshold. I invite business leaders interested in taking part in this exciting program to meet Tashukar Maura. GNH, gross national happiness, therefore, is what defines us as a nation and what guides us as we move forward as a society. GNH has become Bhutan's brand image. That image is so effective, that image is so powerful, that many people are convinced that we Bhutanese are the happiest people in the world. We are not, we can't be. But we do take happiness seriously, and we are trying hard. GNH has also quietly become Bhutan's soft power. This holistic approach to governance and development has caught the attention of several international thought leaders and public policy experts who are attempting to advance the ideals of GNH in their own constituencies. GNH has also been deliberated in the United Nations and contributed to the development of the Sustainable Development Goals. All this has made many visitors to Bhutan wonder if GNH is influenced by Buddhist values. In some ways, it must be so. Bhutan has been predominantly a Buddhist society for an uninterrupted 1,500 years. Bhutan is one of only four countries in the world that has Buddhism as a state religion. What's more, Bhutan is the only Vajrayana Buddhist country. During its heyday, Vajrayana, or Tibetan Buddhism as you may know it, spread from Mongolia through much of China to almost all of the Himalayas. Sadly, Bhutan is the last surviving independent Vajrayana Buddhist kingdom today. But in Bhutan, Vajrayana is thriving. We have more monks than soldiers. And many of them, the monks that is, spend years in solitary meditation. The central monk body does not maintain a national registry of monks undertaking meditation. But they confirm that 50 of their monks, those that are registered with them, are currently undergoing three-year retreats, and that at least one in every 10 of the registered monks, that's about 700 of them in total, have completed their own three-year retreats. I was speaking with Libby Gimbo as I walked in, and I asked Libby Gimbo, by the way, he was in college when he left and decided to pursue Buddhist studies and become a monk. But even so, after that, he has done the three-year retreats on two separate occasions. So he's been on solitary confinement for six years, if you will. And I asked him if he would do it the third time, and he said he wants to do it the third time, but he won't be allowed to do it. Because if he were to do his third three-year retreat, then he would qualify to go into the mountains and just spend the rest of his life in retreat. With Libby Gimbo are two venerable lamas. One of them, they are not in attendance today, one of them has, just like Libby Gimbo, done two two-year retreats, so six years in confinement. But the other has done five three-year retreats. So his eminence has spent 15 years in solitary confinement. So if you're wondering where these monks do their long-term retreats, they do so far away from society, in remote monasteries, and we have plenty of them. For a population of 700,000 people, we have about 2,500 monasteries in the country. But what's more, we have 
10,000 what we call chertans or stupas. These ubiquitous mon monuments constantly remind the Bhutanese of our spiritual heritage. If you go to Bhutan, you're going to see chertans everywhere and anywhere. Amazingly, these monuments contain uh, relics and priceless artifacts that have survived for millennia without any protection. However, many of them have now been started to be vandalized. So it is comforting to know that almost every house in Bhutan continues to maintain a private shrine. We in Bhutan have the hallowed duty to keep this important Buddhist tradition alive. That's why we host an international Vajrayana conference every two years, and that's why we have decided to establish the International Vajrayana Center in Bhutan. If anyone here is interested in learning about the conference, the next conference is taking place in April this year, or learning about the Vajrayana Center, please meet, take a guess, Tashukarma Ura. Vajrayana permeates all aspects of Bhutan. Bhutanese life, with monks conducting rituals to consecrate birth, marriage, promotions, new homes, and other day-to-day -day affairs. Obviously, we turn to rituals in time of distress, sickness, and death. The fact, that, the fact is that Vajrayana is so pervasive in Bhutan that it has not just influenced, but defined our unique culture. So our culture is unique. You can tell by the way we dress, and there are many here. This must be the world's largest pocket. But what might interest you is that this garment can double as a blanket. Actually, the heavier ones feel more like quilts. And this is exactly how it was used in the past, as blankets, as quilts. But many of us still occasionally use it as such, especially when it gets unexpectedly cold. The hospitality here has been so kind and so warm, we have not had to resort to this. <laughs> you can tell our culture is different from the way we eat. We eat red rice, chew on what some people think is rock-hard cheese, and we add butter and salt to our tea and we consume copious amounts of chili. To us, chili is not a spice. To us, chili is our principal vegetable. Similarly, the way we sing and dance is also different. And Sabina has kindly offered a demonstration of our song and has indicated that perhaps we can start dancing also. But what's truly unique is archery, our national sport. Teams of 11 players each compete against each other by shooting arrows at a small target placed 145 meters away. To ensure victory, we cheer our teammates and taunt our opponents. And for good measure, we conduct rituals seeking the support of our guardian deities. So a game of archery a game of Bhutanese archery, our national sport, which can last up to several days, is not just about marksmanship. It is much more. It is a celebration of our martial past, our love for song and dance, and our belief in rituals and ceremony. What I like most about our culture is our women, or rather that women have a special place in our society. For instance, they have their own names. As all babies in, in Bhutan are christened in the monastery, without any reference to their parents or region or caste, creed or class. Every child has a unique name, one that that person keeps throughout his or her life. So my name is Tring Topge. My father's name is Nob Gelsen. It's totally unrelated. My mother's name is Rinchindem. What this means is that a woman 
does not have to take her husband's name. My wife's name is Tashidoma, and God forbid I suggest she change it to Tashitopke. So they don't take their husband's names, nor do they wear a wedding band. Forget about taking a husband's name. When we marry, the groom is expected to move in to the wife's home and to spend his life, dedicate his life to serve her family. And that's why in Bhutan, family inheritance traditionally passed from mother to daughter. And that's why I'm quite happy because I don't have any sisters. <laughs> Many people think that the Bhutanese are a homogeneous people since we are just 700,000 of us. This couldn't be further from the truth. You see, our tall mountains separated, effectively separated our narrow valleys, causing each one to have a distinct culture and feature. Consider language. We're just 700,000 people, but we have 19 separate languages and dialects. That's quite a handful for a small country. But some of the languages are spoken by just a few hundred of people. That's not, that's not uncommon. And we've started to lose some languages, and some are quickly vanishing. Oleka is a language, for instance, but it is spoken just by two people, or spoken fluently just by two people. Since they are spoken just by two people, I must mention their names. Am Chude and Am Mindugem, both ladies and both in the 70s. I wonder what happens when they're not in talking terms. <laughs> so as a people, we celebrate cultural resilience and celebrate cultural diversity. But there are many things that unite us as a people, and one of them is our collective reverence for the environment. The constitution of Bhutan requires that a minimum of 60% of the country must be under forest cover for all time that a constitution compels the people to look after their forests is unique. This constitution clearly outlines responsibilities for individual citizens and the states. But what's extraordinary is that today, more than 70% of our country is under forest cover. What's more, most of our forests are pristine. In fact, they are virgin forests and they absorb about 7 million tons of carbon dioxide annually, easily offsetting the 2.2 million tons of CO2 that we generate each year. That means that Bhutan is not just carbon neutral. Bhutan is carbon negative. I coined this phrase just to rub it in. <laughs> and what I need to rub it in. What really amazes me, and quite frankly, what scares me, is that Bhutan is the only country in the world that is carbon neutral. When we, as a world, are already facing the consequences of climate change, it is unacceptable that only one country, just Bhutan, is carbon neutral. Our forests are not just a carbon sink. They also make the generation of renewable hydroelectricity sustainable. Today, all electricity generated in Bhutan comes from renewable hydroelectricity. And the clean green energy we export offsets about 6 million tons of carbon dioxide in the region each year. We are building a few more electrical uh, hydroelectric projects, and they will be ready in a few years. Then we'll be exporting enough renewable energy to offset 17 million tons of carbon dioxide in the region annually. And if we were to harness all our hydropower potential, this is something we wouldn't do, but if we were to harness all our hydropower potential, we could offset something like 100 million tons of carbon dioxide each year. 100 million tons of carbon dioxide. That, incidentally, is equal to the total yearly emissions of all road transport vehicles throughout the European Union, and as of now, including Great Britain. 
Offsetting greenhouse gases is important, but our forests are an even greater resource for the world as a biological, biological hotspot. Even though Bhutan is tiny, we are the custodians of a wealth of biological resources. For example, we have 5,600 vascular plant species, of which 500, in fact, more than 500 are orchids, and we have about 50 different species of rhododendron. In addition, we have 350 species of mushroom, 600 species of ferns, and countless herbs and wildflowers. This is in a small country the size of Switzerland. Due to the sheer number of medicinal plants that grow in our country, Bhutan used to be renowned as Ho Menjong, or the land of medicinal plants. Even today, more than 200 different herbs and plants are used in the preparation of traditional Bhutanese medicine. But bioprospecting bio has so far been limited. So our forests could hold unknown secrets for the future of medicine. This small country, Bhutan, has more than 200 species of mammals. To put this in perspective, all of Europe, not just the EU, all of Europe has just 219 mammal species. Of the 200 mammal species we have in Bhutan, 27 of them are globally threatened, and these include the rare Bengal tiger and the shy red panda. 770 bird species have been recorded in Bhutan. All of Europe, all of Europe has 700 species. Among our species of birds, 18 are globally threatened, and some, like the white-bellied heron, are already critically endangered. And then we have something like 900 species of butterfly. Again, to compare, all of Europe has just 482 species. What's more, every year we hear, we hear of more species of birds and butterfly and insect being discovered in this biological hotspot. To preserve these resources, more than half our country is protected by law as national parks, nature reserves, and wildlife sanctuaries. Human activity in our protected areas is strictly monitored to the extent, to the extent that mountain climbing is strictly forbidden in Bhutan. As such, we have the tallest virgin peak in the world, Gankar Phinsum, which stands at 7,570 7, meters, has never been climbed. And we in Bhutan pray that it will never be climbed. Today, we in Bhutan can boast that we are a home to a biodiversity that is rich, pristine, and thriving. All this is ultimately because of the visionary leadership of our kings. They are the true champions of the environment. But what this has meant, that, what this has meant is that our kings have had to forego revenue from forestry and mining, revenue that was desperately needed to develop their people. So it is all the more remarkable that even though they were severely constrained by a scarcity of resources, our kings have instituted a robust system of providing welfare to the people. A little known fact about Bhutan is that we are a fully functioning welfare state. This is in spite of the fact that we have a liberal free market economy. Education and healthcare are free, and all citizens have recourse to compensation in times of disaster, deprivation, and destitution. Take healthcare, for example. All people in Bhutan are entitled to receive free healthcare, from vaccinations of our babies to flu shots for our senior citizens, and from paracetamol to chemotherapy. As Bhutanese, we are entitled to free evacuation by helicopter in times of medical emergencies. And if patients require complicated or advanced medical treatment, 
treatment that is not possible in country, they are sent at the government's expense to India. This is why in a recent survey, our people indicated that their biggest expenditure for healthcare was conducting religious rituals. Similarly, our children are entitled to free basic education. This entitlement includes free tuition, but also free books and stationery, and increasingly free food and hostels. Those that make it to college also receive a monthly stipend. All this is expensive. That's why almost 30% of the government's budget each year is set aside for social programs, including health care and education. But the returns, the returns are phenomenal. In the last 30 years, life expectancy has increased from 45 to 70, while infant mortality rates have plummeted from 140 per 1,000 live births to just 15. Literacy, which was in its 40s about 30 years ago, has now increased to 72. And youth literacy, something I'm very proud of, is at an impressive 93%. And importantly, the proportion of the poor has reduced from 31% to 8% in just 15 years. In 15 years, income poverty in Bhutan has declined from 31% to just 8%. And multidimensional poverty, something that Sabina works on directly, is now even lower. It is at 5.8%. Our welfare system is remarkable, and it's all the more remarkable that it, is work, that it works. It is fully functioning, and in spite of the fact that we are one of the smallest economies in the world, our GDP today stands at all of two billion pounds. But there too, we've made considerable progress. 30 years ago, our per capita GDP was barely $155. Today, it has increased manifold to $3,500, making Bhutan eligible to graduate from the least developed countries category. Obviously now, good governance is important to sustain our welfare system. Otherwise, it just wouldn't work. In fact, good, governments, good governance is critical to sustain all that we treasure in Bhutan. Our sovereignty, our unique culture and spirituality, our pristine environment, and most importantly, GNH, our development philosophy that has served us so well. That's why our kings have conscientiously focused on providing good governance. The extent of their determination is aptly demonstrated by the way they introduced democracy in Bhutan. Multi-party democracy, multi-party parliamentary democracy was introduced in Bhutan in 2007 and 8. This makes us one of the youngest democracies in the world. But though we are a young democracy, the democratic process has already taken firm root, with our citizens fully aware of the power of the franchise. For example, we have had only three elections since the start of democracy, yet the country has already seen three governments. In the first election in 2008, my party was elected as, opposition in the op as the opposition party. I served as a leader of a two-member opposition party. The ruling party had a whopping 45 members. Our people may not understand democracy, I thought. Those were very trying times for me. But five years later, in 2013, my party was elected as a ruling party and I was given the opportunity of a lifetime to serve as prime minister. Our people understand democracy. I quickly changed my mind. Those were pretty good times. Then recently, in 2018, we conducted our third election. My party lost. And a completely new political party is now in government. 
Having voted for three different governments in our first three elections, one must conclude that the Bhutanese have already developed a thorough understanding of democracy. You can't start democracy. You can't introduce democracy without elections. You can't say one is a democratic country but not have any elections. So that first election is a prerequisite to democracy. That is really no big deal. The question is, do you conduct the second election or not? And in our case, we did. But we went one step further, because in the second election, we changed the government, which showed democracy was very, very strong. And then we had the third election and changed the government again. So that really means that democracy in Bhutan has really taken strong root. This is not about whether my party wins or not, you see. It's not about whether I am content and happy or not. I am inconsequential. But like I reported earlier, I've been given the opportunity of a lifetime by the people of Bhutan to serve, even if just once, as prime minister. So how is it that our democracy, even though it is barely 10 years old, our people understand democracy? especially the electoral process and the power of the franchise. The unlikely answer is that even though multi-party democracy is just 10 years old, the ideals and principles of democracy have been gradually introduced by our successive kings over more than 50 years. In particular, our people have been electing representatives to the National Assembly, our legislative body, since 1953. And we've been electing representatives to the local government since 1963. Before 1963, our members of the local government were also almost hereditary. It would pass on generally the status of our women in society notwithstanding from father to son. And in 1963, His Majesty the Third King issued a decree, or rather the National Assembly decreed that local government members will not be hereditary, but they will need to be elected. So Bhutan's democracy is young. It is also unique. What most distinguishes Bhutan's democracy from the world's 160 odd other democracies is that we, the people, didn't want it. We did not fight for democracy or even ask for it. In fact, all the people were decidedly against parliamentary democracy. You see, to put it simply, we were happy with the way things were. So the king personally educated his people on the democratic process and then imposed it in the country. Bhutan currently has four political parties. This is another unique feature that distinguishes us. We have four political parties four registered political parties, but these parties do not have clearly defined political ideologies. All four political parties subscribe to the vision and principles of cross-national happiness. And there's good reason for this. It's because political parties were formed in Bhutan and are formed in Bhutan exclusively to contest elections, not because they have a more convincing ideology or a better vision for Bhutan. Besides, GNH has proven to work. And if we stray from GNH, you could bet that this is going to be a political party that does not have any success in Bhutan. Only two parties are represented in parliament. The majority forms the government, and the other serves as the opposition party. This is achieved by conducting two rounds of elections. The first, which selects two parties that will go on to contest the general elections. This arrangement is good for Bhutan in that it gives us, a small country, the best possible opportunity for the government to complete its five years tenure. To run for elections, candidates must be 25 years of age, but no older than 65, and must have a university degree. So one way to look at it is I have a limited amount of time. 
uh, I'm fast approaching 65. The other way to look, out, uh, look at it is I can go flat out for the 10 years I have remaining, and then I can retire. One more unique feature of our democracy is that the state finances all election expenses, including campaign expenses of candidates and political parties. So these are just a few of the many unique features of our democracy. The main point, however, is that His Majesty the King did not just introduce democracy in Bhutan, he had to impose it on the people. But His Majesty went further. He educated and trained all his people in the democratic process. And most importantly, His Majesty the King designed our democracy to suit our unique needs, ensuring that Bhutan's democracy is fit for purpose to serve country and people. So our democracy is not an end in itself. It is a means to protect our sovereignty, to nurture our unique culture, to preserve our pristine environment, to strengthen our welfare system, and to ensure that political leaders and decision makers remain faithful to the ideals of gross national happiness. So this concludes my schematic overview of Bhutan. So where does that intersect with Bhutan studies and the International Society for Bhutan Studies? First, focusing on each, it is interesting to study and understanding, understand each of these qualities well. For example, why is it that visionary environmental policies are politically feasible in Bhutan, even if they have serious economic impl implications for a small economy? And why are such policies absolutely impossible in many other countries? Next, studying change is vital. How are the rich traditional cultural traditional cultural and language groups navigating the entry of cell phones and globalization. Incidentally, almost every Bhutanese and definitely every young Bhutanese can speak the English language in Bhutan. So how does that impact our culture and our different language groups? We know from our statistics that in the last five years, between 2012 and 2017, multidimensional poverty has been halved. But what do better services in education, healthcare, roads, and electricity feel like? For instance, how would farmers explain what changed in their lives after electricity reached their remote villages? Do they use less firewood? Has it made farming easier? Has it improved? the quality of their lives. Last, and perhaps most importantly, research for policy is also needed to address some of the change challenges that Bhutan faces. Climate change is a prime example, but there are other challenges too. Rapid and unplanned urbanization is a big one. Creating desirable jobs for our youth is another. And as we graduate, from the least developed country category, and donor present changes, we need to readjust our economic patterns. But how do we do that? And coming to gross national happiness, we have learned that we do not need to necessarily follow the policy models of other countries. In some areas, we can innovate. We can lead. These are but a few examples of the many challenges Bhutan faces. I look, forward to the, I look forward to the papers presented in this conference and the subsequent meetings of the ISBS, the International Society for Bhutan Studies, which will no doubt help scholars, decision makers, and business leaders to navigate our challenges using evidence, thoughtfulness, creativity, and wisdom. I thank the International Society for Bhutan Studies for organizing this conference on Bhutan and for giving me the opportunity to speak here. I have purposely avoided an in-depth discussion, discussion 
preferring instead to present a broad overview of what I consider unique, even extraordinary in my country, in order to showcase why Bhutan matters and why it is worth studying, worth studying for all the world, yes, but especially worth studying for my own country, Bhutan. I thank you very much for your kind attention. Tashidile. Come there. Yeah. Doctor. Come, doctor. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, I'm sure many people have questions that they'd like to put. Um, so can I invite questions, comments, thoughts, ideas? Doctor, I must clarify, I have a whole team of experts here. Right. So I, I, I may, you must allow me to uh, request, divert the questions to the experts. Of course. Including yourself, Doctor. <laughs> <laughs> Would that it were. Yes. Um, good afternoon, Dasho. Excuse me. Good afternoon, Dasho, Sering Tope. Um, we shortly met in November, and um, when I introduced myself as an advocate for GNH uh, in Germany and across Europe, uh, you had some wise words saying that it is very important and relevant to spread the message about GNH within your country. Uh, so now, uh, having heard your speech about GNH and about leadership skills, good governance, uh, what would you say, what are the essential leadership skills to empower your people within Bhutan to practice GNH in the remote areas as well as in the urban areas? What are the key essential leadership skills to make this happen? If you received wise words, you, you didn't talk to me. You couldn't have been talking to me. Uh, GNH is so widely spread and spoken about in Bhutan that the danger is you lose focus. Uh, you lose the narrative. And it can get quite confusing also. And uh, this is why Tashukarma Ura uh, set up the Center for Bhutan Studies and GNH Research. And uh, they've been taking this very seriously and they've conducted several nationwide uh, surveys and they've taken the time to, obviously they analyze the uh, results of the surveys, but they've taken the time, having drawn conclusions from the surveys, to explain to the people. And I think that goes a long way in explaining to the people, explaining to me, for instance, what GNH is at an individual level and how I can contribute towards enhancing my own contentment and well-being and that of my family and how I can contribute to uh, a GNH in the country. So you speak of leadership. I want to say two things. Uh, one is by understanding the results of the survey and the nine domains and how they can enhance one's own happiness and contentment and then applying it within one's own environment, immediate own, in, uh, own immediate environment, I think that is leadership. Uh, you really don't have to operate at a national level all the time, particularly in terms of happiness. I think this goes for happiness in general, uh, but it certainly applies to GNH in particular. The other thing about leadership is, uh, today I, I try to, without being too direct, celebrate the leadership of our kings. And that leadership has been proven, it's been tried, it's been tested, it works. So in Bhutan, we have the great opportunity of not having to obsess with one's own leadership. So when I served as prime minister, I didn't have to really think about the fact that I'm a leader 
Am I a leader? Am I leading? What is my legacy? Because we have our kings. And so we are in a very, very fortunate situation where we have the leadership and we have the moral authority provided by the kings and we can do the easy part of managing, focusing on administration, focusing on implementing plans. Right? You? Yes? No? You? That's right. Good afternoon. Um, during the 2013 elections campaign, uh, long before the advent of the uh, false news that permeates the American media, or the alleged false news, you and some of the media was depicted as being opposed to GNH. And I can't imagine for the life of me why anyone in the United States would think that. And I was wondering if you were aware of that or if you have any idea why that may have happened. This was a piece written by Time, and uh, the Times newspaper. And I think they, uh, uh, they, 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 the headline was misleading. The story, I, I haven't really obsessed about it, I must be honest, so I don't remember the details. But I think the story said something uh, like, uh, I don't want to keep talking about GNH, I want to implement GNH. I'm more interested in its implementation. But the headline was quite misleading. He's not interested in GNH. So I, I suppose we all make these mistakes once in a while. Uh, but that w I think that's what you're referring to, and especially coming from America. <laughs> you know, because it was an American newspaper. I have nothing against Americans. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Um, yes. First of all, thank you very much for this uh, fascinating lecture. It was very interesting to learn more about uh, Bhutan or even to learn new things about uh, Bhutan. My question uh, relates to the young population and to the youth. Um, you mentioned that every young person in Bhutan speaks English now, probably, of course, has access to internet and has smartphones and uh, is part of the global world. So I'd like to... Um, hear more about whether there is this same sense of belonging and uh, you know uh, agreeing to uh, the GNH with the young population and if so is it thanks to the education system or but is there a risk going forward with the uh, globalization that they may be somehow less uh, acceptance by the young generation, or not acceptance, but at least less interest. Thank you. So for us, English is important. Uh, we are a small country, 700,000 people, and uh, we don't have the resources to uh, translate the world's knowledge into any, any, one, any one of our 19 languages. So English is very important if we want to grow if you want to prosper, if you want to thrive. Uh, and English, in my view, is no longer the language of England or the British Empire. It, 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 it's, I see it as the language of the world now. And so uh, if there is a language that's perhaps most useful with the least amount of threat, uh, I feel it has to be English. Uh, does it affect our children? Uh, yes and no. Uh, yes, in both the negative and the positive sense, it does affect. A positive because it gives our youth access to the world. Uh, and uh, in the negative sense, because perhaps uh, some of the things we learn uh, may be perceived to be not too good. I mean, it's all relative. Uh, uh, who decides what's good? But anyway, that can be considered the threat, not necessarily the negative part. Uh, but our youth are so uh, 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 spirituality and our culture is still so vibrant and uh, they are so interconnected with G and H that uh, I think in general our youth 
expect not just of themselves, but of their political leaders uh, to advance GNH ideals. So regardless of what they say, as a politician for me, if I say that GNH is all hogwash, we're going to go another direction, I can expect to be voted out. That's not what I said, and that's not why I got voted out. Okay, but uh, that's the surest and the quickest way to be booted out. So our children do want GNH, and they feel passionately about it. Uh, another indicator is when our children uh, do projects, whether they are studying in Bhutan or the few that study in the world, uh, one of the first projects they latch onto is GNH. So it shows that whether it's through the education system, through the parents, or through public policy, that our youth uh, are very well connected. They feel a sense of connection uh, with GNH. And of course, the obvious uh, reason for that is also because uh, our youth, all citizens, but especially our youth, feel a very strong sense of bond and connection with our kings uh, through GNH. Yes, sorry. You first, then you. Thank you very much, Dr. Sring. Um, since uh, GNH is the national philosophy and indeed protection of the environment is included in the Constitution, what do the political parties compete with? And if it's not too indelicate a question, uh, before I ask the question, we heard an amazing statistic this morning that 42% of the electorate are your Facebook followers, which is more than 42%. Incredible statistic. You need to redefine followers, obviously. Well, so if it's not too indelicate a question, how did you manage to lose the election? <laughs> so on, uh, how do you differentiate between uh, political parties? I suppose it's promises, and promises not necessarily based on any of the uh, uh, conventional ideologies of the world. Yeah? Uh, the right and left and center and center left, center right, and therefore these are my plans. No, it's it's uh, all our plans uh, should be more or less consistent with GNH, not by any reason, but not by any compulsion other than the hope that the electorate will support you, and and then we differentiate ourselves with them, with our plans. I also believe uh, this is my own belief. Uh, we have many Bhutanese here. They, they have, uh, many of them have voted against me, obviously. Uh, but I think when we vote in Bhutan, we are not voting for leaders. Like I said earlier, we are voting for administrators. So perhaps even unconsciously, we are actually voting for administrators. That still means that I have been chosen as the worst among those in offer, even as an administrator. So which goes to your second question. Why did I lose in spite of having a great many uh, uh, Facebook followers? Yeah, we have to change the word followers. Uh, one, in one word, arrogance. You think that you have fulfilled your promises, uh, you've done what you said you will, and uh, you expect people to uh, uh, support you the next time around, uh, and you don't work hard enough. Okay, so arrogance in a sense that as a team, uh, we may not have worked hard enough. Remember, we have two rounds of elections. The first, like I said earlier, is a primary round where uh, all registered parties participate. Right now we have four, and we choose two parties. And everybody said you are one of the two parties. Everybody, including many in this room, by the way. And that, that's a sure recipe to failure as I can uh, 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 testify now. But everybody thinks that you're going to win. So you don't work hard enough, and those who are voting perhaps will not vote for you knowing that you're going to win. They'd much rather put their vote to good use. And, uh, and so you think that you're going to be participating in the next round of elections, and uh, uh, reality hits you. So that's why I think we lost the elections. The gentleman there who... Someone has his hand up there? No? Oh, well. Yes. Do go ahead. 
in case there's nobody else, I thought a Bhutanese should also ask a question, sir. Mm. Uh, we heard this uh, statistic. In fact, I should put it in perspective. It was at a very interesting session this morning on uh, politics and elections in Bhutan, role of social media. And the statistic is that uh, you, sir, have 42, above 42% of registered voters in Bhutan following you on Facebook. Amongst world leaders, that's the largest following. The second is the president of Cyprus, 7%. It was Romolo, something like that. So the person who has the next largest following has only 7% of registered voters. So 42 over 42% is a large, large number. And my question is related to this role of social media in elections, because there's been a lot of talk, a lot of discussion, uh, also in our traditional media, and we saw that in the morning. Uh, and with the high internet penetration, especially uh, on mobile phones, almost everybody, including my mother, who's about 92 years old, I think, we are not sure, has a smartphone so that she can chat with her grandchildren. But uh, with this high penetration of internet and lots of activity on social media. How do you see the role of social media in elections, sir? Thank you. Uh, I don't believe those numbers. I mean, 42%, you said? Of registered voters in Bhutan. No way. 42% of registered voters following me, absolutely no way. Uh, there are many from, uh, I mean, If I have to agree to 42%, it means that I have failed uh, even uh, more phenomenally. <laughs> because I had access to 42% and I did not use it. And yes, I did not use it. I am, as, as, as social media, uh, my, my presence as, uh, as dominant as it appears to be and as active as I appear to be, uh, some of the uh, Bhutanese here will know that I'm quite shy on social media. I don't argue. And I'm not very opinionated in the social media. I don't have to be right in the social media. And I don't argue. Which goes me to the next step, uh, the future of social media. It is those who, don't, who are opinionated and don't uh, shy away from expressing their opinions and, and, and really uh, shoving it down the throats of the uh, rest and proving that they are right and standing their ground uh, uh, with social media, that seems to be the way of the future until our electorate is more uh, educated. And I'm not just talking of Bhutan, I'm talking of the world. So social media is, at this rate, it's just going to get more vicious, it's just going to get more dirty. I'm still oh? puzzled at 42, sir. Well, I, I wish, if it were true, I, I wish I'd known that. But it, it, it can't be because, I mean, it really can't be. It, it's uh, the number of people in the villages. Villages. Yeah, if you take uh, a proportion of that and then say 42, how many villages uh, might be required to follow me, I'm not too sure. Well, I'm afraid we don't have time for more formal questions, I'm sure. Dasha, you will uh, be happy to talk with people if they want to talk with you individually. But um, I'd like to thank you very much for this excellent and very informative talk, uh, which actually gives one a great deal to think about, I think not only concerning Bhutan, but about the way we run our states insofar as we can be said to run them. Um, we hope that uh, you'll uh, have a very fruitful and um, I, I'm sure you will have an excellent future ahead uh, before you become Prime Minister again. Um, and whatever direction you move in, the wealth of experience and energy that you have will, is going to lead to something very good. Uh, but it's been very good to hear your thoughts. And I hope the we will all now join together in thanking Dasha Tsering Tsongay for, Tsongay for, for his uh, stimulating and extremely far-reaching discussion. Doctor, thank you.